Well, good morning. How are we doing today? Doing all right? Oh, uh, come on. I know you can do a little bit better than that. Uh, I've actually got a friend watching online today, and uh, his words were like, because the, the camera angle doesn't show that there's actually people in the room, uh, because you guys go movie theater seating, and you sit like all the way in the back, which is fine. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, but I just need, I need him to understand there are people in the room. And so if you could help me out today, uh, how are we doing today? Doing all right? There we go. Already better than first service. Man, first, I'm kidding. I love, I love this place. It is a joy and an honor to get to come back to this place. Uh, I was here just about a month and a half ago. I've been here a couple times uh, before. And so if I've gotten a chance to meet you yet, uh, man, let, let's connect after service. I'd love to connect and, and get to know you a little bit more um, before I head home today. Uh, but I do want to do something real fast that uh, I was not asked to do. So it's very important that I say that I was not asked to do this, but I want to do this uh, specifically today for uh, the pastors of uh, Northview. So here's the deal. October is past. Pastor Appreciation Month. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, we get our own month. Look at us. Uh, we're, so, we're so cool and privileged to get our own month. And so I would love for you just to take a second. Um, can we just appreciate the staff and the pastors that are here? Can we just do that real quick? Yes, absolutely. I, I love this team. I've told you that before. I went to college with most of this team. I've worked with Jeff. I've worked with Nathan at two different churches. He keeps leaving me, um, but uh, it's been a joy and an honor just to come back and to, to connect with all these guys again today and over the course of this weekend. And uh, if you can, over the month of October, just appreciate them, whether it's a gift card, a high five. Nathan loves hugs, and so give him as many hugs as you possibly can. Like, the kiss on the cheek is also a good, good, uh, I'm kidding. Please don't do that. I, I don't want to never get to come back. So, uh, Man, it is a joy. I'm going to pray for those guys and pray for our morning, and then we'll jump in. God, I thank you. I thank you for today, and I thank you for uh, the pastors that are here, the team that's assembled here. It is a joy and an honor to come back here and to see these guys and to see what they're continuing to do with you, with your help and what you're able and capable of doing in the lives of people around us. Uh, God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the opportunity uh, that I have to speak your word today, and so allow it to be your word, not mine, that you would get me out of the way and you would speak through me today clearly, appropriately, and with conviction. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. Well, we are in this series called Compassion. Everybody say Compassion. All right. And we're looking at stories of Jesus when Jesus was filled with or when he had compassion upon other people. And so over the course of the series, we've been looking at opportunities where guys or ladies are uh, hurting, they're depressed, they're filled with anxiety, they're, they're struggling in sin or shame or guilt or pain or something. And Jesus comes along and is filled with compassion and then has acted upon his compassion towards people. And today we're going to continue in this series. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 is a story in which Jesus shows compassion upon a man. Now, we're going to look at a story that's found in three of the four Gospels. So the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they are four stories or four accounts of Jesus' life on this earth. And this story in particular is found in three of them. Matthew talks about it, Mark talks about it, and Luke talks about it. I don't know why John chose not to talk about it, but that's beside the point. And so it's in surround sound, if you will. Three different Gospel writers said this is an important enough story that you should know the compassion that Jesus had for this man. And so we pick it up, Mark chapter 1, verse 40. It says this. It says, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, I looked in Matthew's gospel. I looked in Luke's gospel. We're in Mark's gospel. I wanted to find out more information about this man. But nobody tells us his, his hair color. Nobody tells us his eye color. They don't even give us the common courtesy of saying his name. Instead, all we get is his condition. His condition is that he has leprosy, meaning this, we can know more about his condition than we actually know about his future. You can be wrapped up in your identity based upon what you are or who you are more than by your name. And so this man is only known by his leprosy. Now, I want to draw your attention to a couple parts in the first part of this story. It says that a man with leprosy came to Jesus. Now, a man with leprosy, he's got an obvious problem. It's all over him. It's a skin disease called leprosy. He'd have boils and sores all over his body. He couldn't hide this. It's not something he could hide. And so he's then cast out outside the city walls. He would have shame from having these boils and sores all over his body. We can learn more about leprosy from Leviticus chapter 13. Leviticus chapter 13 is more of a dermatology manual than a devotion. So if you're looking for a devotion today, I would not suggest going to Leviticus 13. But it says things like this. 
It says, if you have leprosy or anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean, unclean. As long as you have this disease, you remain unclean. As long as you have this disease, you remain outside the camp or outside the city walls. And people would have reacted or responded to people with leprosy much like a dead body. Fear and repulsion. And so outside the city walls, 50 paces away, they would just be yelling out, unclean, unclean, unclean. They couldn't get within 50 paces of somebody else. And I don't want you to miss this. The Bible says a man with leprosy came to Jesus. Now, first century readers would have heard that and they would have leaned in. First century readers would have heard that and they would have said, I don't understand. See, people with leprosy don't come to people. They especially don't come to famous people. And Jesus' ministry is growing. Jesus is getting more and more and more famous as he's going about his business. And so as he's getting famous, this man with leprosy hears about him. And it says that he comes to Jesus. Now, I've said it a number of times, and I want to just continue to say it because it's very important. He can't come within 50 feet of Jesus. Because if he comes within 50 paces of Jesus, what happens is, is Jesus is now contagious. Anybody that's around Jesus, anybody that's around this leper, if they come within 50 paces of him, they're now contagious. In fact, common law back then was that you could pick up a rock. If they came within 50 paces of you, you could pick up a rock and throw it at them to say, stay away from me. Stay away. Can you imagine for a second? Like, imagine for a second, you've got a head cold. Okay, and a head cold is different than leprosy. I get that, I understand that. But imagine for a second, you got a head cold and you need to go into Walgreens to get some cough drops. You need to go into Walgreens to get the, the NyQuil or whatever it is. And the moment you walk into, I walk into Walgreens, you yell out, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. And somebody picks up candy corn because that's the hardest thing in Walgreens. They pick up candy corn and they just throw it at you. Can you imagine for a second? Like that's, that's the law. This man is coming closer and closer to Jesus. And law would say, pick up a rock, throw it at him. Don't miss this. Don't miss the fact that this man comes to Jesus. Maybe all you need to hear today is this, that everything that God wants for you starts with you coming to Jesus. Everything that God wants for you, maybe he wants to heal you. Maybe he wants to change you from the inside out. Maybe he wants to forgive you of your sin. Maybe he wants to wash away and wipe away all of your sin or shame or guilt or pain. Everything starts with you coming to Jesus. See, we have to come to Jesus to receive the grace of Jesus. We have to come to Jesus to receive the love of Jesus. We have to come to Jesus to experience the faithfulness of Jesus. We have to come to Jesus to understand the compassion as we're talking about in this story, the compassion of Jesus. See, if the leper would have just stayed where he was, he never would have received from Jesus. And this is the part where maybe you're here today or maybe you're online today and you're thinking to yourself, I can never come to Jesus. Ryan, you don't understand where I've been. You don't understand what I've said. You don't understand all the things I've gone through. You don't understand the pain of what I'm carrying. You you don't understand. There's no way that I can come to Jesus. The choices I've made, the decisions I've made. Watch the rest of this story unfold. This man has heard that Jesus can heal lame people, can restore blind people, can raise people from the dead. He's calmed storms. He's fed 5,000. He's done so many things. He's told demons to sit down and be quiet. And this man hears about the fame of who Jesus is. And he says, maybe, just maybe, he can do something about my skin condition. Maybe, just maybe, he can do something about the condition that I find myself in. And remember, he's 50 paces away, and the Bible says he comes to Jesus. And so he's got to take these 50 paces, and he's got to get to Jesus. And I would imagine, as you would, the first step was probably the hardest. He's 50 paces away. The first step to get to 49 had to be hard. 50, 49, 48, 47, 46. 45, nobody stopped me yet. 44, 43, 42. Where was Peter? Where was Peter in all this? I mean, if you read through the gospel accounts, Peter was a guy who's always putting his foot in his mouth, isn't he? He's a guy who's always running farther in front of Jesus, and then Jesus has to correct him, and Jesus has to like fix his mistakes. In fact, there's one story, and maybe this is a result of that story. There's one story in Gethsemane when Jesus gets arrested, 
And, and as Jesus is getting arrested, there's this guy named Malchus. He's, he's there to arrest Jesus. And as he's arresting Jesus, Peter pulls out a knife and cuts off Malchus's ear. And then Jesus is like, Peter, what are you doing? And picks up the ear and snaps it back on Malchus like a Lego piece. It's a whole thing. I mean, where was Peter in this? Where was, where was Peter? This guy's 42 steps away from him. Jesus is already contaminated. He's already contagious because he's within 50 paces. 41, 40. Skip ahead, 30. 29, 28. And this guy's thinking, nobody stopped me. I've lost so much already. Because I've lost so much, what more can I lose? I got to get to Jesus. I got to get to his feet. Get to 15. He can now see him. I mean, he's within an eye shot. He understands that he's close. He's in proximity to Jesus. And he could have stopped there and yelled out as other people did. He could have yelled out and said, hey, Jesus. But he's like, no, I got to get to him. I got to get to his feet. 10, 9, 8, 7. You can hear his heart begin to beat, right? 6, 5, 4, 3. Remember, he's got boils and sores. It's not like he's hidden. Everyone knows who he is. Everyone knows the condition he finds himself in. Three, two, one. I took 50 steps to get here. And I know that I shouldn't be here. I know that it's customary for you to shoo me away. I know it's customary for you to do something to me. I know it's customary for you to be upset that I'm within uh, within one step of you now. And I shouldn't be here. And you know I shouldn't be here. But he gets on his knees. He bows his head. Check out what he says. If you are willing, you can make me clean. If you're willing, meaning I know you can. I've heard the stories, Jesus. I've heard what you've been able to do to other people and for other people and with other people. I've heard all of these great stories. I know you can do something about my condition. I understand you can. If you are willing, you can make me clean. He's got contagious confidence, doesn't he? He's got contagious confidence. Uh, My son has contagious confidence as well. I actually brought him with me on this trip uh, because I wanted some car time with him. And so we've been talking a bunch this trip. But uh, a couple years ago, my wife and I were getting ready to go uh, to to Vegas over New Year's Eve. Now, hear me say this. The only reason we went to Vegas over New Year's Eve is because that was the only place we could go. It was during COVID. So don't be like, why'd you go to Vegas during New Year's Eve? It's just a thing, okay? And so we're getting ready to go to Vegas for New Year's Eve to meet some friends in Vegas. And so we sent our kids off to my sister's house. My sister lives in a little town called Holdridge, Nebraska. Anybody know where Holdridge, Nebraska is? No, you don't. No, nobody does. Uh, because it is a tiny, 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 tiny little town in the middle of Nebraska. I mean, it is, it, is, it is not a metropolis at all. They've got a gas station that's not even open on Sundays. That's how small the town is, right? Like it is a tiny, tiny, tiny little town. And so my kids were getting ready to go there. And so it's December into January. Because like I said, we're going to go spend New Year's Eve. So it's December into January. They're going to go stay at my sister's house. Now, I don't know how you parent. We parent with a lot of freedom and flexibility for our kids. We're trying to teach our kids about responsibility, trying to teach our kids about how how to go about life and navigate life. And so what we did is we said, kids, you go pack yourselves. You go pack yourselves. My son was, I think, eight at the time, maybe seven. And so we said, go pack, have fun, man, go get him. And so he goes in and he starts packing stuff in his suitcase. And he brings out the suitcase. And now as a parent, like I said, we, we, we give them freedom and flexibility. But at the same time, I want to make sure they're equipped and prepared. Right? Amen? Yeah. Okay. So I'm like, I got to go through the suitcase. And so I start going through the suitcase and there's like 19 pairs of shorts in there. Like that's all he's packed. Remember, it is December, January. You don't need to know enough about geography just to understand that Nebraska is cold. There is snow. It's going to be a blizzard. It's not going to be uh, short weather, but that's all he's packed. He's got no pants in there, not a single pair of pants. He's got like one sock, no pairs of shoes. So I don't know what the sock was. Anyway, so he's got the sock. He's got, uh, you know, just shorts. He's got flip-flops. And then at the very bottom of the bag, so the first thing he packed, the very first thing he packed, the bottom of the bag, Swimsuit, goggles. <laughs> Love my son. Swimsuit, goggles. And I said, Daxton, I need to understand what you were thinking here. And so I pull him in and we're talking about why he packed a swimsuit and goggles. I said, Dax, you're going to Holdridge, Nebraska. There's no way you're going swimming. It's, it's December and January. There's not a chance. You are not going swimming. Go ahead and take the swimsuit and the goggles out. And he's like, no, dad, I'm leaving them. I'm leaving them in. I said, Okay. So tell, tell me why. He goes, Dad, you never know when you might go swimming. 
Dax, you go swimming that week? Did you go swimming that week? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. You bothered my sister the entire week long, right? He just bothered and bothered and bothered and bothered and finally, finally got to go because he was confident enough. He was confident enough. If I take a swimsuit, if I take my goggles, Tammy's going to have to take me. She's going to have to. He was confident in this. He had a contagious confidence that he riled his cousins up. He riled his siblings up. They were all ready to take it on. They were all ready to the Lord of the Flies, the thing. They were going to figure it out. We're going to figure this out. We are confident about this. Church, here's the thing. We need to be people. We need to be people who pack swimsuits everywhere we go. We need to be confident enough that Jesus can and will do something about our situation. That he can and he will do something about our pain and our shame and our guilt and, and, and whatever it is that we're going through. We need to be people who pack a swimsuit in our workplace and pack a swimsuit in our homes and pack a swimsuit in our neighborhoods that we might walk around with a joy and walk around with an expectance that God can do something if he's willing. This man had contagious confidence. Here's, here's what faith is. Faith is being confident that Jesus can and hopeful that he will. That's what faith is. It's being confident that he can and hopeful that he will. And so this man comes before Jesus and he bows down before Jesus and he says, Jesus, if you're willing, you can do something about my condition. Check out Jesus' response. It might shock some of you. Verse 41, Jesus was indignant, angry. Jesus was angry. And you might think that Jesus was angry at this man. I mean, after all, this man gets within 50 paces of him. He's now contagious. He now basically has leprosy. He could be angry at this man, but that's not the case. Instead, if you read deeper, Jesus is angry at the way this man is being treated. He's angry at the way this man has been treated his entire life. He's been cast out. He's been pushed to the outside. He's been left alone. He's lost everything. And Jesus is indignant, not at the man, but at the people. If you read deeper in the other texts, it says that Jesus is filled with with compassion for this man. There's that word. Jesus is filled with compassion for this man. Verse 41 continues. He reached out his hand and he touched the man. I'm willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Put yourself in this story for a second. This man goes before Jesus. He kneels down, head down. Says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Silence. Absolute. And silence is probably worse than words at this point, right? I mean, he's now, he's stepped out 50 paces. He's within a foot of Jesus now. He says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Silence. And silence is broken, not by words. Silence is broken by the last thing the leper would have ever, ever, ever thought a touch. The question of willingness from Jesus is shattered not by words, but by touch. See, if you read through scripture, you'll find that Jesus didn't have to touch everybody he performed miracles on. He, in fact, was within miles of people sometimes. But this time, for whatever reason, Jesus reached out and he touched the man. You know, sometimes I get asked the question, Ryan, what's God like? You know what God's like? God touches the untouchable. That's what God's like. In your deepest hurts, in your deepest grief, in your deepest sorrow, in your deepest anxiety or depression, God meets you right where you are and he touches you. And then look at what he says. He says, I am willing. If you've ever wondered if God is willing, God is willing. That's your answer right there. He's willing. He's not intimidated by what you have. He's not intimidated by your past. He's not intimidated by what you carry. He's not intimidated by anything that you've got going on in your world. He's willing to touch you and say, I am willing. He's willing. But more importantly, not just is he willing, he's willing to be with you in it. He's willing to meet you right where you are and understand the condition you find yourself in and meet you right where you are and then live with you in it. Last February, I had the privilege of taking my kids to Disney. Anybody ever taken your kids to Disney before? A couple of you? Yeah, you understand that you no longer have a bank account when you're done. Um, 
but we, we took our kids to Disney. We've been planning for about five years to go. We wanted to wait until our kids were a specific age to where they might remember things and, and enjoy it. Um, because we went to Disney. I went to Disney with my wife without any kids, which, by the way, is the way to go. And Because uh, you get to see everybody else's meltdowns, and you just kind of watch them and go, like, that was a really expensive meltdown. Um, but uh, So we, we decided, you know, at that moment, we went just Blair and I. We decided after this, we've got to wait until our kids are old enough to where if they're having a meltdown, we can look at them and be like, be an adult, even though they're not. And so uh, it was one of those. So we'd been saving up and saving up and saving up. And then my sister was like, I'd like to go too. And so my sister tags along and she's got some older siblings, uh, older, older kids. And so their siblings are older than my kids. And so we're, we're trying to explain to our kids, there's some rides that you may not all get to ride. Like your cousins are going to want to ride the Tower of Terror and they're going to want to ride the Rock and Roller Coaster and maybe, just maybe, you're not going to want to ride some of those rides. And my two oldest kids, uh, they were 10 and 8 at the time, they were both like, we're going to ride them. We're going to ride everything there is. And so the moment they say that, my youngest daughter, who is 6, she was like, if they're riding, I'm riding. She is bullheaded. I don't know where she gets it. She, uh, she has an attitude and a spunkiness to her that she's like, whatever it is, like, I'm all in. I'm in. Uh, if dad's going to do it, I'm going to do it. If the kids are going to do it, I'm going to do it. Everything they're going to do, I'm going to do because I am just that kind of human being. And that's just the way she is. Again, I don't know where she got it. Um, but we're, we're getting ready to go. And there's one ride in particular. She'd been watching documentaries the whole time about all these different rides. And there was one ride that she was like, I have to ride that ride. The ride was called Slinky Dog. Any Toy Story family, fans in the house? Toy Story? Yeah. This, this ride is exactly what you'd expect it to be. There's the front of the dog and the back of the dog, and the middle part of the ride is a slinky. It is a roller coaster, okay? It's a roller coaster. Now, I got to ask you, church, how many times do you think that my, at the time, six-year-old daughter has ridden a roller coaster? Anybody want to guess? Zero. She has never in her life ridden a roller coaster because before that was COVID and uh, I would not going to take like a three-year-old on a roller coaster during COVID, right? So uh, she's never been on a roller coaster in her entire life. And so here we are, we arrive at the park and we fast pass or Disney Plus or Genie Plus or whatever it is they're calling it this week, that ride specifically. We said, we're going to go to that ride right off the bat to get it out of the way. We want to get this thing out of the way so that it's done, it's over. It's the only ride that Ezra wants to ride. We're going to go. And so we get there, and we arrive at the park, we go straight to that ride, we're getting ready to ride that ride, and let me say this, we never got to see the ride go, because we were one of the first people on the ride, we never got to see it go. So I had never even seen this ride, I didn't watch the documentaries, I assumed that my better half, the more responsible one, would have watched the ride, watched the documentary, done something, some sort of research, I assumed she would, she's the mother, so why wouldn't she do the research? And so I just assumed for a reason that this was okay, she's obviously done the research, we understand, we're going to get Ezra on the ride, she's going to love the ride, we're good to go. So we buckle up, we get in the ride, we're ready to go, and I'm father of the year at this moment. The reason I'm father of the year is because my daughter, that's all she's wanted to do. She didn't care to meet Minnie or Mickey or any frozen princess. She didn't want to do any of that. All she wanted to do was ride Slinky Dog. And so father of the year, I got her on Slinky Dog early in the morning. We're ready to roll. And so because of that, I took a picture. Here's the picture. I wanted a picture for my plaque, father of the year. Okay. It's going to go right on the plaque, right, right where it says father of the year. Well, it's important to understand this is the before picture. Very important. It's about this moment that the ride starts to take off. And at this moment, I'm realizing this was a bad idea. Because the ride starts and it does one of these turns and then it starts to go straight uphill. And you don't have to understand a whole lot about roller coasters. You just need to understand physics that what must go up must then do what? Come down and sideways, right? It is going all over Andy's backyard. It's going to go every direction possible. We're going to do a loop. We're going to do all sorts of stuff. And at this point, I'm looking around and I'm seeing this is a terrible, terrible father move. She starts crying. She's white knuckling it. She's looking at me like, how could you do this? I trusted you. You're my father. She's now disowned me as her dad. She's now calling me Ryan. It's a whole thing. The ride continues to go. She is, ab she's having none of it. She's crying. She's upset. She's angry. She's hitting me with her hands still on the thing. She's just trying to hit me. She's doing everything she can to let me know that I've failed as a father. I've failed as a parent. I'm the worst human being in the history of the world. And as she's doing all of this stuff, I lean over to her and I say, Ezra, isn't this so fun? No, it's not, Dad. I hate you. You're the worst. 
My wife's in the back. She's had her hands up. She's having a blast. <laughs> keep leaning over to her. And I keep saying those words over and over and over again. Ezra, isn't this so fun? Isn't this so fun? The right ends. Thank God. We arrive back at the spot where the car is parked. And I thought, you know what? I've already got the before picture. Might as well take the after. Here it is. There it is. <laughs> Every mom in the room is like, oh, I can't believe it. Every dad's like, yeah. <laughs> Teaching her a lesson. We get done with the ride. We're making our way down the little sidewalk. You know the sidewalk where they take all your money at Disney? It's, it's a great a great sidewalk. So we're making our way down that sidewalk. And I look over at Ezra, and Ezra looks back at me. She's my shadow. She's my buddy. She, she wants to be wherever daddy's at. I mean, that's what she wants to do. She looks up at me, and she goes, Dad, that was so fun. <laughs> you kidding me right now? There was nothing about that that was fun. For me, there was nothing about that that was fun. For you, there was no, like, what ride were you on? Did you forget what ride you just rode? Like, do you need to go back to Mickey and Minnie's adventure? Like, what, what happened? That you think that that was so fun. So for the rest of the day, my mind is just spinning. For the rest of the day, I'm trying to figure out what was it about that ride? Because if you ask her today, if you say, Ezra, what was your favorite thing at Disney? She will not say, I met Minnie, I met Mickey, I hung out with Daisy. Her favorite thing of all of Disney, if you ask her, you know what it is? Slinky Dog. She will go ride Slinky Dog today. She'll go ride Slinky Dog tomorrow. She loves Slinky Dog. And so my mind begins to go like, what was it about that ride? You know what it was, church? Here's what it was. I was willing to be in it with her. She knew because I kept speaking over her. I kept speaking over to her saying, isn't this so fun? She continued to be reminded over and over and over again, even though the ride was uncomfortable. Even though every turn and every space and every loop and all of that was completely uncomfortable, she knew that I was with her in it. And because she knew her father was with her in it, she was willing to ride in it longer. She was willing to put up with it longer. And at the end, when we finally came to a stopping point, she looked over and she finally said, Dad, that was worth it. For so many of us, this is our life. That we've been riding the slinky dog of life for so long that we've been carrying our guilt and our shame and our pain and our addiction and whatever it is, our anxiety, our depression, we've been carrying it for so long and all the while God's in it with us saying, I'm with you. I'm with you in it. I'm right here beside you. Don't get your eyes fixed on everything else. Don't get your eyes fixed on Andy's backyard. Put your eyes on me. I'm right here with you. So often, we get our eyes fixed and focused on the fears and the anxieties and the hurt and the depression and all of this other stuff that we forget that our Father is with us in it. See, this story should show you that he's willing to meet you exactly where you are, that no matter what you carry, no matter what you have, he'll meet you right there. We pick up the story in verse 43. He's just healed the man. The leprosy has gone away. Don't miss that. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Now, this can be confusing. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, don't tell anybody. The reason you don't need to tell anybody is because if you tell somebody that I touched you, I now have leprosy. I don't have the boils and sores all over me, but I now have leprosy because you are contagious and therefore I am contagious. So please don't tell anybody. Just go about your life. Just go about your business. Don't tell anybody because if you do, then I have to take your place. Verse 45, instead, I love this, instead he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. Jesus touched me. I mean, we, we, we can understand this, right? You can't blame him. This man has been outcast for who knows how long. And while he's been outcast, he finally gets healed. And Jesus says, don't tell anybody. And this guy's like, you won't believe what Jesus did. Continue verse 45. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Don't miss this, church. It's really easy to read over this and miss this. Jesus traded places with this man. He traded places with him. This man was held on the outside of the city walls, left there. 
He gets healed. He gets to come in. And because he spread the news of what Jesus has done for him, now Jesus has to live outside the city walls. Jesus has to stay outside the camp. Don't miss the fact that this man switched places with Jesus, that Jesus switched places with him. Don't miss the imagery there. That for you and for me, Jesus switched places with us. That because of the sin that we have in our life, when Jesus came to this earth and he lived and he died on a cross for us, he switched places with you. He took and he bore all of your sin and my sin on the cross so that we might live eternally with him in heaven. Don't miss the imagery here that Jesus is willing to meet you where you are, be in it with you, and, 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 switch places with you. So how do we make that happen? Here's how we do that. We come to Jesus just as we are. Just as we are. So many people get caught up, and I've got to fix this about my life. I've got to change this. I've got to do this. And once I do that, then I can come to Jesus. No, 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 no. We come to Jesus just as we are, with your sin, with your shame, with your guilt, with your pain, with your anxiety, with your doubt, with your fear, with whatever it is that you're carrying, your health, your relationship struggles, whatever it is, we come to Jesus just as we are, just as we are. See, the thing that would have eliminated this man from coming to Jesus was the same thing that Jesus had to heal. The thing that would have eliminated him was the leprosy. And because of the leprosy, he would have said, you know what, I can't go towards Jesus. Don't let the thing that you need Jesus to heal be the thing that keeps you from coming to him. Second thing we can learn is this. We come to Jesus with confidence, with confidence. Here's the question I want you to wrestle with this week. Where is God calling you to be confident that Jesus can and hopeful that he will for you? Where's God calling you to be confident? Where's God calling you to, to, wear, to bring your swimsuit? I know you can change this. I know you can do this. I know that you can uh, affect this part of my relationship. I know you can affect this part of my emotions. I know you can affect this part of the way that I live life. I know you can do something. What's he calling you to be confident about and hopeful that he will? Maybe you're here today and you understand that there's some stuff in your life relationally. You want to, to fix the relationships in your life, the, the broken marriage the thing at work, the thing with a friend, the thing with a parent, the thing with a teacher. And you're here today and you're saying, man, I, I'm confident he can. I just need to know that he will. If that's you, I'd love for you to respond today. And maybe you're here today and it's, it's emotional. You've got doubt, you've got fear, you've got anxiety. And you're saying, God, can, can you do something about what I'm carrying? The fears, the doubts, the anxiety, the depression. Can you do something about my emotional state? I know that you can. I'm confident you can, but I'm hopeful that you will. And maybe it's financially, that you might give back to him generously because he's given so much to you. And maybe it's spiritually, that you've been walking for a long time and you're just not ready to meet him face to face. And you've been carrying your guilt and your shame and your pain and whatever it is that you've been carrying for far too long and he's just 50 paces away. In fact, he's really just one pace away. Would you be willing to take that step today to say, Jesus, I'm confident that you can do something about my sin and my shame, and we're going to switch places. You're going to take my sin and my shame, and you're going to bore it on the cross so that I don't have to. Whatever condition you find yourself in, church, he's willing to meet you. All it takes is one step, not 50, one. On the screen, you see that QR code? You can scan that today if you'd like to make a decision. If you want to have more of a personal relationship, somebody, talk to somebody. I'll be right down here. Nathan's in the room. Sean's in the room. Brian's down the hall. Jeff's right here. Come interrupt him. I don't care. Don't miss this opportunity to take this one step today towards him. Let's pray. God, I thank you. Thank you for today. I thank you for the reminder that no matter what we carry, no matter what our past is, no matter what our shame or our guilt or our pain that you meet us, that we don't need to shout out that we're unclean. We don't need to stay so far outside of the camp from you, but that God, you invite us in and you meet us with compassion and care, and more importantly, grace. God, I'm thankful that you love us in spite of us, that you invite us into relationship with you. And so God, I, I pray for this church today that if, even if there's one person today that needs to make one step towards you, that's all worth it. 
but I know all of us can make a step towards you today. God, we love you, and we thank you for your grace and your love towards us. It's your name that we pray. Amen.